to welcome my friend and colleague, Dr. Emmanuel Sotole. Emmanuel is a Zimbabwean scholar currently pursuing a postdoctoral research fellowship at Northwest University in South Africa. He earned a Master's of Arts degree in African Languages at the University of Zimbabwe and later a PhD in the same subject from Rhodes University in South Africa. His doctoral research focused on the intellectualization of his mother tongue, Ndao, a marginalized minority language spoken in Zimbabwe and Mozambique. Through examining a raft of strategic interventions to solve the historical, linguistic, cultural, social, technological, economic, and political impediments aff afflicting Ndao people in both countries. Dr. Sitole's research continues to shine a spotlight on the wider sociolinguistic situation of marginalized transboundary languages, cultures, and identities in Southern Africa. His work has been published in journals such as African Identities, Language Matters, and Lexicos. Dr. Sitole serves as an intellectual advisor to the Ndao Language and Culture Association that successfully lobbied Zimbabwe's government to constitutionally recognize Ndao as an official language. He is also a language policy advisor to the Ndao Materials Development Panel that creates educational and other materials to facilitate the teaching and learning of Ndao as an indigenous language subject in Zimbabwean schools. According to my Facebook memories, mm -hmm. Emmanuel and I first met exactly four years ago today uh, when he came to visit Dr. Jeffrey Willis, a professor emeritus from the linguistics department, who they had been working together on some language preservation uh, projects. And since then, Emmanuel and I have stayed in touch. We've been collaborating at a distance, and it's been really a delight to have him here for the past two weeks so that we could work on some projects together in person. So please join me in welcoming Dr. Emmanuel Sotole. Okay, um, thank you very much to you all for coming to this presentation. And I'm closer to the mic. Oh, okay. Uh, <laughs> And a uh, special thank you to Professor Katrina Daly Thompson for inviting me here uh, all the way from South Africa to come to the University of Wisconsin to speak to you about my research. And um, um, as she said, uh, um, we, we met a couple of times, we met uh, a couple of years ago and then um, we have been working together so well. And. Uh, to, to add on to what she has just said, uh, I went to South Africa for the first time in, uh, uh, in 2014 when I went to a student PhD. And uh, during that time, I also got an opportunity of learning South African languages, which are Isi Kosa and Isi Solo. I'm saying this because I think that it might interlink with what I'm going to present today. So there are certain areas where you might, where I might use my skills as a linguist to 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 talk about uh, the issues that we are talking about today. Uh, so uh, the topic of my presentation is now transborder spirits, languages and identities in Mozambique and Zimbabwe. Um, so um, what I want to do now uh, is to try and explain and describe to you what are the now people and what is their religion and uh, where is the difference, uh, where is the connection between the human world and spirit world. And then I also, I'm also going to go on and, uh, and talk about the kind of study that I did, was it the ethnographic and stuff. So to start with, uh, the Ndao people um, are people who are found in Zimbabwe and Mozambique. They are, um, they are separated by an artificial international boundary. I will explain what I mean by artificial international boundary. And these people, they are found in, uh, uh, in districts such as um, I'll talk more about that as well. And then uh, let me quickly talk about their, their, their religion. Uh, so you find that these people, they, the, the traditional religion, they believe in spirits. And according to some scholars, they say the Ndao people are notoriously religious. They are notoriously religious in the sense that they can't, uh, they, 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 there's always contact between the human world and the spirit world. And there's continuous engagement. Continuous engagement in the sense that uh, the spirits they depend on people for physical en engagement, whilst the the, the uh, whilst the, the human beings they also depend on the spirits for healing, for prophecy, for guidance, for security, and for protection. Um, so 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 that's the kind of uh, connection between the human world and the spirit world according to that people. 
and then uh, uh, in this uh, in this research in this study, I used it as an ethnographic study, and uh, where I collected interviews. Uh, semi when I, where I conducted semi-structured interviews uh, in Mozambique. Uh, and also in Zimbabwe. I will talk more about that as well. And then um, I have some uh, research questions that I going to that are going to guide me as I'm going to talk about this. And so, so the first one is what is the relationship between uh, between the spirits and the, the people's transport identities. The second one is uh, what elements of now spirituality uh, help in recreating Mandela's history. And then the third one is to what extent. Uh, the study of Dao spirituality impact on the shared notions of Daoness in both countries. Um, so, uh, some of the findings that I got when I was uh, doing this research was that uh, uh, you would find that uh, our study of spirits they help in uh, in in, uh, in showing that uh, spirits they influence, uh, they recreate, they reshape, and uh, reinforce and solidify shared. Transnational identities, histories, uh, cultures, and Daos, uh, and languages of Dao people. They also, the study of in different spirits also, uh, they help us in understanding the historical epochs that the, these people they passed through from the 17th century to the, 18th, to the 19th century and to the 20th century. I will talk more about that. And also, I, I also found out that uh, as we studied these, uh, these languages, they also show that the fact that they are spoken in Mozambique and also the fact that they are spoken in Zimbabwe, it reinforces a shared notion of nowness. Mm -hmm. So uh, I will talk about the presentation plan. So I will show you the map of Africa and the research side. I will go on to uh, talk about the stories surrounding the border and then uh, the description of Dao spirits and then I will go into a discussion. Okay. Um, so uh, this is the map of Africa as we all know. Uh, so you will find that uh, uh, in Southern Africa, that's where you find now in Mozambique. And uh, uh, this is where we are talking about official borders. We are saying these borders are artificial because uh, uh, you, you find situations where uh, you have uh, uh, a king or a chief in Zimbabwe, for example, Chief Mapungwana. He is a chief in Zimbabwe and he's also a chief in Mozambique, right? And then uh, you can also find situations where, like, uh, personally, I have a family, three quarters of my family members are in Mozambique. And uh, we also have half of our families that are in Mozambique. And uh, you would find that my cousins in Mozambique, at one point when there was civil war in Mozambique, they would come to Zimbabwe for school and they would do that daily. And for us, during the rain season, during the planting season, we go to Mozambique to farm there daily without even air without even uh, uh, requiring or being requested to produce uh, uh, passports because there's no border that is there. What you can find is a situation where they can be a mountain or they can be a river or they can be even just a pathway. So I'm saying there are, pathways, there are, there are artificial borders in that sense. It's just like for international, uh, it's just a, you know, an international boundary that does not even exist. So in actual fact, you find that uh, there's continuity despite the presence of an international border. People continue to speak the same languages, people continue practicing the same cultures. And I think this also relates to other cultures. For example, you have Yoruba in Nigeria, you can have a Hausa in Nigeria. You have the same language that is spoken in more than five countries. And um, you can also have, uh, maybe in Zimbabwe, you have Tswana. It's spoken in South Africa, in Zimbabwe, in Botswana. And this, uh, the, the situation is like, it, it goes on from country to country, where these people, there are these people who speak the same languages and speak, uh, practice the same cultures, they are just differentiated and distinguished because of a boundary that does not exist. Per se. So, uh, so I will, I will talk. Um, I will also talk about uh, the research side. Oh, the research side. All right. Uh, so, so that's the research side. So uh, Chindau it can be uh, divided or subgrouped according to language, it can be subgrouped according to, to, to the region, it can also be uh, identified according to, to nationality. So for example, uh, you can see that this is, here yeah, this is the, 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 the border between Zimbabwe and Mozambique, uh, and it's artificial as I was saying, because uh, there are no border posts here, people just pass, people just pass. So if you are here, in terms of language, this is where, uh, this is the coast of Mozambique, this is where they speak uh, Shanga, 
And if you're around here, this is where they speak uh, 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 Nanda. So in Mozambique, we have two different dialects of Ndao, whereas in Zimbabwe, we have three. And if you're around here, uh, if you're around here, this is where I come from, and we speak down down. And then the, if you are around here, we speak that way. And uh, if you are around here, we speak, uh, they speak, they speak in uh, Tonga, which, which are the five varieties that, co uh, that, that concatenate to make uh, what we call now. So uh, as a linguist now, uh, I, when I was doing my study uh, in, in, in South Africa, I realized that uh, uh, we can really group these, uh, these languages according, these different dialects according to, la, to nationality. For example, you can say uh, you have in Mozambique and now you can have situations where uh, it is influenced by Portuguese. For example, you have Kumita for food, and whereas in Zimbabwe we say it's Chekura, which is an, an influence from Shona. And you can have Chapewa for heads, and then uh, for now speakers in Mozambique they say head, which is a direct derivation from English. And that's it, uh, those are the external influences. And then you can also go on and look at uh, uh, the vocabulary differences between uh, Mozambique and Dao and Zimbabwe and Dao. And then you can have uh, for water, you have Puma, and then you can have Mvura. And then uh, for the logical differences, you can also have uh, Musolo in Mozambique, and then you also have Musoro. So the difference there is phonologically, the difference between L and R. And then uh, semantic differences, they can say Nanga to mean to say, it's the same word, but it means different when you are in Mozambique and Zimbabwe. So those are the differences uh, at that level. So I have, a, 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 so now I'm talking about uh, the spirits, uh, spirit stories surrounding the border. Um, so I have lots and lots of those spirit stories when I was interviewing people. Uh, but for, uh, in the interest of time, I won't read everything there, but I'll just comment on, on what I have there. So when, for, on the underlined phrases, for example, we have powerful and dangerous. So we say a spirit is powerful because it heals, because it protects, it guides. But it is also dangerous in the sense that, if you are reading that, it is also dangerous in the sense that it can cause illness, it can cause diseases, it can even cause madness, and it can even cause death. So this is the spirit of a moon king, who was called Ngukunyana. So it's a powerful spirit, but it's also dangerous because it can cause all sorts of ailments. It can even harm. And then uh, it's a territorial spirit. So when you're saying it's a territorial spirit, we're saying this is a guardian spirit, right? They are owners of the land. So if you want anything to do with fertility, with the rains and stuff, you go to that spirit because it's the guardian of the land. That's what the people believe. Uh, and then uh, you cannot stand it. So you, I, I couldn't stand it. I wanted to interview the spirit, but they said, no, 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 no. This is a dangerous spirit. You cannot even uh, interview it. Because it is a spirit that is consulted by kings, by chiefs, and headmen. So as an individual, I can't go and address my, 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 my case to it. And then, um, then they try to cover uh, uh, some other spirit they run for cover when it comes. So by running for cover, it shows that it is a, it is a frightening spirit. And then both human and uh, spirits, they run away from it because of its power. And then um, uh, I also have it also almost strangled the spirit of Tingani. So this basically shows that uh, uh, there's no, it's not always paradise in the spirit world. This spirit, they also fight. They also have conflicts. And then uh, uh, this spirit, because uh, it is a powerful spirit, it was the spirit of a king, it uh, comes, sits, and participates in uh, uh, traditional judicial services. So when they are like uh, shining a case, this spirit can, out of its interest, it can be invited or it can come uninvited. And then it can sit there and then it can be watching how you administer traditional uh, justice. And then uh, uh, the, the last one that is underlined is uh, it's, it, it is also quite capable of descending fake from uh, from 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 uh, true spirit. So you know, we, in, in the in the speech, in, in the spirit world, uh, if you are possessed, a medium, a host, he is somebody who commands some uh, some some source of authority. You know, because by virtue of you being uh, a medium of some spirit, you enjoy some social and cultural authority such that people tend to respect you because you are a host to a certain spirit. And then uh, 
uh, some people they can even fake, they can even lie that they are they are mediums because they want to extort people, to extort money from people. They would want to lie people, to lie to people and say oh, we are capable of doing A, we are capable of doing B and C and C because I'm possessed by a spirit. So that's uh, the spirit. Uh, the spirit of Gugunyana is uh, is quite against, and then it can descend, can make a distinction to say no, this is a fake spirit, this is a true spirit. Okay. Uh, now I'm uh, going to the spirit categories that I identified. Um, so the spirit categories, uh, you would find that say, we have ancestral spirits, which are called, uh, that's, I was told that you say in parentheses here, back home we call that uh, brackets. So you have Mizimu there. So we call them brackets, but here I was told that you call them parentheses. Okay. <laughs> so, so, so what are these spirits? What are these spirits? So these are spirits of deceased family members. It could be a sister, a, a mother, or a father. So that's, uh, these are spirits of those people. And they die, and then they feel that they are not yet done with the human world. And then they want to come back in form of spirit possession. They can possess a family member. And uh, uh, these spirits, uh, when they possess, when they come, I'm using the word come in court. Uh, when they come, they need water, uh, they need salted and salted meats, they need beer sometimes. And then uh, when they come, you have to dress appropriately. And this appropriate dressing, it involves uh, uh, white and black wrappers. And then maybe somebody who might be interested can look at uh, uh, the meaning, the spiritual meanings of these colors. Maybe, for example, to say white, it stands for peace. Black, it stands for uh, authority. It identifies with blackness and stuff. Right. And then these spirits, they speak, uh, the, the, uh, this Mizimu spirit, the spirits, they speak the languages of the deceased. So if my father died speaking Shona, then the spirit, when it comes back, it speaks also, it also speaks Shona. And then uh, generally they are respectful, and, uh, but still they are commanding. They can also be, they have, among some of their functions, they protect, they guide, they inform, they advise. And then uh, what happens in a situation where we have maybe three spirits coming from this from the same family, uh, like their spirits now, we don't, as, 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 as human beings, we don't know how to distinguish them and how to respect them. So what happens there is that uh, uh, you would find that if my father, the spirit of my father, uh, it's, it is possessing a family member at the same time with the spirit of my brother. So the spirit that we respect more is the spirit of my father because of his title and also because of his age. Uh, so this is the first category. And then the second category, this is a, uh, the, sp uh, the second the category of uh, uh, spirits of young girls, or jipuna. They are also known as jipuna. They are also known as jisora. They are also as jisnyasikana. They can also be identified as jisikana. So what are these spirits? These are the spirits of female, uh, these are female spirits that are uh, mostly from uh, Gutu and in the Sabi Valley region in Zimbabwe. And then these spirits, they are spirits of young girls who died at an early age. And when I was looking at it, based on the language that they, they, they speak, uh, I say they are, I think they should have died between four to six years. And why am I saying that? I'm saying that because they speak a language that is unintelligible. We can't really understand what they, what they say. It does not make any sense to anybody who is there. So I'm saying, okay, because of their inability to, to produce and use language in a way that we understand, maybe they died when they were still uh, at that level where their linguistic abilities were not fully uh, developed. Uh, so these are spirits, uh, one thing that is outstanding about these spirits is that they are so much afraid of white people, such that if they, if they possess me, if that spirit possesses me, and then uh, there are some white people that are around, then it can either hide, it can either run away, it can either fade. And why is that? This is simply because uh, there are 17th century sp uh, uh, spirits from between 17th and 18th century. And then that time, they had not come into contact with, uh, with, with white people. So they are so, much scared, uh, they are so much scared when they see white people around. So, so that's, that's what they do. And then these spirits, they also eat uh, rock mountains. Uh, when they come, they eat rock mountains. Uh, they, they eat mountain rock crabs, I'm sorry for that. And then they also eat okra. They can also eat uh, uh, green chaff porridge because they were starved, because uh, they died at a young age and they died because of hunger. 
they like. And then uh, they were, when they were still alive, they were left in the care and in the custody of uh, uh, abusive and cruel uh, stepmothers who denied them food. So they had to go to the mountains to look for food, and eventually they died because of hunger. So that's, uh, those, these are the spirits that I, I have. And when I went into Mozambique doing research on that, I realized that some of them, they say, even if some of them, they say they come from Gotu and Sabi Valley, those that are in Mozambique, they have completely forgotten where they come from. So that's another thing that I may comment on. Right. Um, so as a linguist, uh, I, I studied the languages of these spirits and I was saying, okay, so let me look at it. It does not make sense to say C in, 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 in Shona or in Dao or in any Zimbabwe language. Neither does it make sense in Mozambique. But as a linguist, I try to look at the structure of the language. I realize that ah, even if these words are really meaningless, but when I'm looking at the morphology, when I'm looking at the phonology, I realize that these languages are this language that we speak is more or less similar to Ndao. So that's what we have. So that's why I was doing that comparative analysis. We have seen what uh, we have seen. This is, Chini, this is the meaningful statement in Ndao. You have uh, Sakandai and you have Chakandai. So it's while this the, the while the spirit this this language that the spirit is using does not make sense, but it's more or less closely linked to now, right? Um, so that 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 takes me to uh, my second category, which is the category of Nguni uh, warriors uh, or called Majiti, and then uh, they are also called Majiti or Machomana. And if I'm looking at it as a linguist who understands some little bit of history, you would find that machomana is more or less closely linked to mashob, mashobana. So I'm saying, okay, this, 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 is, this really makes sense because mashobana and machomana, they are so close to each other such that it, uh, it qualifies them to be good spirits. And then these are male spirits, these are male spirits and uh, they, can, they can possess anybody, they can come possess a child, whether female, whether male, they can, uh, uh, when they, they speak uh, Chinguni, and uh, when I was trying to look at what Chinguni is, I'm talking about, I will talk about that again, when I'm trying to look at Chinguni, I see that it's an ancient form of uh, Nguni languages. So now you have Swati, you have Ndevele, you have Zulu, and you have Isikosa. But Chinguni is like something like an, an ancient form of it, right? And then this, as you can see on, on, on the two photos that are, that are on the slide, you have, they use those ones, these are the weapons that they use. That's a, a long spear, it's called Mukondo. And then uh, they also dress in red, red skirts and feathers, feathered hands, as you can see. And then uh, when they come, when they possess me or they possess anybody, they want boiled corn, they want water, and then uh, they are also experts in hunting and uh, uh, in healing and in providing protection. Uh, generally, they are violent spirits, and, but they can also be very humble if they want and very respectful if they want. So I'm going to play a, a video of this spirit. Uh, so let me just say if I can play. Uh, So, 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 so this is uh, the spirit. You can see that uh, the spirit has its drinking water, I guess, and then it has some spirits, uh, it has some, 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 some arrows, and then it has some tables. So, so that's, that's, I, I won't finish that. I won't finish that. Right. Um, right. So, when, when, when I uh, I, I talked to these spirits, uh, when I talked to these spirits, um, I realized that uh, are, um, I talked to, I think, around 10 spirits uh, when I interviewed them. And in one case, it was a group interview where I was talking to them as a group, I think around four. And then I realized that these, these spirits, they, in as much as they say they speak the same language called the Chinguni, I noted because I'm now conversing with Zulu, I'm, 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 I, I understand Zulu very well. I realized that these spirits, they speak differently, and I was saying, how do they speak differently, if yet they claim to be uh, the same, more or less similar spirits. Then I realized that uh, uh, there was, for example, there was the spirit of Chabulani, the spirit of Tingani, then there's also the spirit of Tukemanzi. You see, the first two spirits, they speak uh, 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 
they speak, uh, their nouns, the way they use nouns, they have uh, the, like the initial prefix U and O, whereas the third one does not have. And then the same applies to that word is poko poko and chipoko poko. So you would find that uh, they, 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 the third one, it's, it, it's, uh, it's, 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 uh, it removes is the EC, the as an initial prefix, and then it transforms it into, uh, into G, which is more or less like now. So I would say uh, this spirit, it is uh, borrowing much from now, other than from uh, relying on Zulu or Goni languages. And then when I was thinking to say, what causes that? And then I was told that these spirits, they also learn because they are spirits. And then when I talked to some of them, they indicated to me that no, they also learn because they realized that uh, some, of the, uh, some of the patients and some of the hosts and their attendants, they, uh, their attendants, they uh, don't understand uh, how to speak these languages. So they took it upon themselves to learn their languages instead. And that's why you see that uh, their languages are very much influenced by, uh, by, 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 by Shona or by Dao, right? And then uh, that takes me to, to, to the third category, which is the category of uh, Mozambican healing spirits. So these are called, in, 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 in Dao, these are called Congo or Manyango. And then uh, when you are in Mozambique, they are not considered as Mozambican spirits, they are considered as Mizimu. You remember the first category that I talked about, yeah. But when you are in Zimbabwe, that's where we, we identify them as Mozambican spirits. And um, when they, they, they want beer, these ones, they are not worried about anything. They just want beer when they come, when they possess me. And then uh, they speak a language called the Chitanda. And then their costumes, as you can see, there's some Vladna, there is black, white, and red. These are the colors that they like so much. And then um, you also have that they are very much well versed with uh, uh, this nation, which is Kuringiza, in Lokondao and healing, which is Kurapa. So that takes me to uh, the final category, which is um, the spirits of uh, liberation struggle fighters. Uh, these are called also in, 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 in Dao, these are called also Jayungu. They are also called uh, uh, Negro. I don't know whether it identifies with Negroes or what, what I don't know, but they are called Jayungu or Negroes. So a uh, literal translation of the word Jayungu, it means Europeans. Right. So uh, these are 20th century spirits. They, are, they came in the 20th century. And uh, they are said to be controversial because they dress, as you can see in that spirit, that's a baseball cap. And then it's dressing in that uh, uh, white button down colored shirts. And then when they possess a, a, their hosts, they drink beer, like bottled beer. Uh, they drink, they eat rice, they smoke cigarettes, and then people are saying, ah, what kind of spirits smoke cigarettes? Are these not people who are just hungry? <laughs> you know, maybe they want nice things. Yeah. So they are known for, 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 for preferring nice food, right? They want the salads, they want all these things. But in rural Chipinge, those things are difficult to find. So, uh, but they are also spirits that are very powerful because uh, they died in combat. So they are very protective spirits. But they are also, to some extent, disrespectful. They are overconfident, but they are also disrespectful. So uh, whereas other spirits like Majiti, the Nguni uh, warriors, would come and greet people, these ones they don't greet, these ones they don't, they, they even shake hands with the chiefs and everybody. So they are like spirits that are called, that are referred to be as controversial and they can be troublesome sometimes. So. Yeah, so these are the, and then for, for the languages, they also speak uh, uh, Zezuru, they also speak Manika, and then they also speak uh, Ute. They can also speak Ndao, because they are a uh, language, e even in Mozambique, when you go to Mozambique, they don't speak Portuguese, they speak the indigenous languages in, uh, in, in, in Mozambique there, right? So this is an interview that I did with uh, this Chimu Yungu, and maybe, maybe, uh, let me see if I can. So, 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 so,
but uh, I, I, I struggled to call them. I could not even call them Ndau spirits because uh, they, in as much as they exist amongst Ndau people, you find that these spirits they are unwanted. Uh, to some age, these are like spirits of uh, Ngoz, spirits of Mvuko spirits. They are avenging spirits. For example, my father killed somebody and then the spirit comes back to haunt our family. And then, uh, because it's a spirit that exists among us, but we don't want it, we exercise it, we chase it away. So, we can't even really call them Dao spirits because you don't have a host for a Ngoz spirit. They don't have mediums that speak for themselves. So, so, so the, 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 those are the other kinds of spirits that we have. And uh, for questions for uh, questions for discussion. So, uh, what I found out when I was studying these spirits, I said, uh, if you look uh, at Mudimu spirits, they are they are always there. The spirits of ancestors, the ancestral spirits, they are they were always there since when we started existing, or since when we started to be called these now people around the 16th century, they were there. And then uh, you look at the other kinds of spirits. Uh, the, the Jibunda spirits, the spirits of young girls, they speak to a particular, they tend to remind us about our history as it happened during the 17th to the 18th century. So, and then uh, you go on to look at the, uh, the Nguni spirits, which are the 19th century spe uh, spirits. They, 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 they speak about, um, or they remind us of uh, this, uh, the, 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 amount of, uh, the, the amount of time that we spent under Gazanguni invasion and uh, conquest and overall, which was, and they also uh, relate, they also tell us about the kinds of uh, problems, the challenges that we, ex that our ancestors uh, uh, were, subjected to, were subjected to during the time of the Gazanguni conquest and overall. And by the way, the Gazanguni conquest, uh, mm -hmm. it, uh, it, it lasted for around uh, uh, 75 years from 18, the 1820s to 1895. And then uh, when you look at the, the last spirits that I spoke about, the Jiva Jung or spirits of, uh, of, uh, of, of, of uh, Europeans, <coughs> they also speak to uh, the idea that Vandao is a people, they were, they were colonized by, 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 by white people. And then when their presence now in our society, it, ma it reminds us about that particular uh, that particular period. So I'm saying, if you look at the, uh, if you only look at the spirits as they manifest amongst us, you find that we get to learn more about our history as Ndau people. And then the spirits also, they also help us in understanding that Ndau people, irregardless irregard of the uh, uh, international boundary that uh, geopolitically separates Zimbabwe and Mozambique, they are still one. Because it's only in it's only among the Ndau that you get majority spirits. It's only among the Ndau that you get young spirits. And you get that in Zimbabwe and you get that in Mozambique. If you go to the Makua people in Mozambique, you don't get majority spirits. Because there was no historical contact, historical contact between the Maji and the Makua people and, and the Majiti. So so I'm saying it's it reinforces, it solidifies a shared uh, a shared sense of nowness. Uh, so that's my that's that's my presentation, and uh, I have to thank you very much uh, in English and no bonga ya mo in dau tinatenda shkuru in shona ya bule la kakulu in isikosa and ya bonga kakulu in Zulu and Tembele and then obrigado muito in Portuguese. Thank you very much. Do you want me to help the facilitate the queue? Yeah. We have quite a bit of time for discussion, about 20 minutes. Ed? That was a fascinating talk. Thank you very much. Uh, I have one question about the hungry spirits. When you, when you prepare food for the spirits, do you consume the food yourselves, or do you bury the food, or how, how, how is that? How, how, how does that work? Okay, uh, thank you very much for, 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 for the question. Uh, so you prepare the food, uh, the normal way you prepare the food, and you give it to the spirit, because uh, the spirit 
So what happens is that I didn't talk about spirit possession because it's an area that has been covered. There's literature, there's a lot of literature around that. So I didn't talk about that. So when the spirit possesses me, it's the spirit that exists in me. Not, so I cease to exist as an individual. It's the spirit that, I, that exists. So you give the food to me and I eat, but it's not me eating, it's the spirit that is eating. So, so you'd find that uh, it would be, would be more interesting for things like beer. So you give a spirit beer and it drinks and it gets drunk, right? And then uh, after the spirit disperses or it goes, uh, I remain unclear. So I don't get intoxicated because I was not there. So I cease to exist for some time as the spirit gets control over me. So that's so, what so, so, so in other words, you're actually feeding the possessed people. It's not the whole group assembled that gets to eat food. No, 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 no. It's the spirits. Right. Yes, yes. So, so suppose, uh, suppose you make, uh, uh, you give me unsalted meat. So it's me who eats. My belly does not get full. What gets full is the belly of the spirit. And then maybe after the possession, uh, maybe I say, oh, can I get some food? And then people start wondering, but you were eating. And I say, no, it's not me who was eating, it was the spirit. Yeah. Oh this time, yes, yes. <laughs> Thank you. Okay. I'm sorry, I forgot your name, but All let's right. go ahead. Uh, thank you. I'm 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 and uh, Thank you so much for for that uh, illuminating presentation. I think I was highlighting to you how you're dealing with uh, an area I have found interest in, and um, I think so. I really liked your idea about artificial borders, um, and I am curious when you refer to these chiefs who are. We've, we've got an area of jurisdiction that goes beyond the border. Are those chiefs recognized by both countries? Like, is this a chief by Zimbabwe laws as well as by Mozambican laws? Or is this a chief as recognized by Zimbabwe and Mozambican communities? I want to understand whether they are recognized both at the level of the community as well as the laws of the countries. and. Also, this concept of side-by-side, side, I'm also curious, when we're talking about this um, type of spirituality, I'm, I'm curious about the extent to how well practiced is it within the community exclusively as opposed to, you know, syncretically with Christianity, since we know in Zimbabwe Christianity is the dominant form of religion. Um, and what is the placing within these communities of this type of belief vis-a-vis those dominant religious views, and what's the effect of the dominant religious views? My curiosity is a lot of people now talk about um, a concept of nyanga, musikawano. So, like a lot of people now seem to project the idea of a sky god in the sense that we understand from Christianity as being the ultimate, even within the spiritual world. I wanted to know whether you share that view, whether that view is shared, or whether that is distinct from what you're describing. And and finally, I think my question is about the, and I think you touched on this towards the end of your presentation, I'm curious about the extent to which your findings can be generalized um, over Zimbabwe's Shona speaking groups. Like, I, I'm quite a boy myself, um, but, but my best friend is now, some of my best friends are now. <laughs> um, and so, uh, but, but listening to you, um, some uh, my understanding of this sort of world is not as a practitioner because I, I have not really lived among the Korekore people. Um, but a lot of things you were saying are things which I have understood to be part of a spiritual belief amongst Shona speaking peoples. That is to say, when you talk about avenging spirits as well as Vatsimu. But then at the end, you then say, but only amongst the Ndao in Mozambican. In Zimbabwe, uh, do we have majority in Shwaini? And is that the extent to which what you were describing is unique to the Dao? And can the rest of it be understood as generalizable um, regarding Shona speaking people in Zimbabwe? Okay, okay. Uh, thank you very much. Um, so I, I think uh, I'll answer that in three parts. Uh, and then the first part is that uh, you talked about uh, the laws of the countries, Mozambique country, the Mozambique. Zimbabwe to say to what extent do they do they uh, the, to, to what extent do uh, the two countries recognize Mapungwana as a chief in their countries? Uh, they, is there a legal infrastructure that can uh, 
uh, accommodate him to practice as a chief in Mozambique and Zimbabwe. I don't know really, I really don't know about that, but what I know is that in Zimbabwe, Ma, Ma, Ma Pungwana is one of those chiefs, and you know back home these chiefs, you can easily identify them because they get cars from the government. Yes, so in Zimbabwe, I don't know whether he gets cars from Mozambique as well, uh, but uh, yes, so in Zimbabwe he is recognized. But I think at a political level, uh, I would think that uh, uh, the kind of pressures that are coming from Mozambique, it allows them, uh, even the government, to recognize him. Because maybe these people, they go there to the government with real problems. And then they say, we belong to the Makungwana clan, which has been divided uh, by the border. So I think it, they allow them, because uh, if they didn't allow them, Makungwana was not going to have two, two palaces. Because he has a palace actually in Zimbabwe and a palace in Mozambique. So I think there's some sort of, uh, maybe they allow him, maybe secretly or, or directly, to say, okay, you can practice your, 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 your chieftaincy in both countries. So I think at that level, I don't, yeah, I don't know about the laws because I didn't research that. But I talked to him, he said, no, he's allowed. He's allowed, he has subjects both sides of the border. So I think at that level, he's allowed. And then, um, you also touched about, uh, you also talked about the issue of uh, uh, to what extent are my findings generalizable to the, so, so you'd find that the issues of uh, spirit possession, uh, they, I think across, all, across, across the whole of Africa, if you go to Malawi, we have more or less similar issues. If you go to Mozambique, if you, okay, I was reading a paper about the Oromo spirits, I think it was written by somebody who is an emeritus professor in this department. And he was speaking uh, to the same issues that I addressed today, to say these spirits they possess, they do this, they do this, right? But what I find particular with regards to the now now uh, is the issue of uh, the issue of spirits, because what I what I gathered as I was doing this research was that you can't be, because it's like the same way you can't be, like for instance, you can't dream of yourself as somebody who is in Athens when he never went to Athens, I don't know about that. Yeah. So my point is that there needs, there's a need for some conduct, whether historical or cultural, for people to start having spirits. That's how I, I like to start having spirits that uh, 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 arise and that emerge, because they'll be trying to uh, speak to that historical process where there was conduct. So when I say it, uh, it's something that happens only in, uh, in, 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 in those speaking areas, I was speaking specifically to the issues of the Majiti spirit, because the Majiti spirit, they, they affected the, the, the Ndau area, they were under Sushangana, okay? So the reason why we have them is because they were there in Chipinge, uh, they were there in Mozambique during the 19th century, and that's why we get the spirits. But I think the issues of Yuayung, I think it can be generalized, it can, you can find those spirits maybe uh, in, 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 in you can find that in Botswana because these are spirits of white people. I don't know. So I didn't go that far. But I think this, the, the issue of uh, uh, European spirits of Europeans, it can be generalized anyway. And then what was the other, the, the last one I was asking about? Yeah. Oh, yes, 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 yes. yes. So I, I, I said, I think you, remember, you recall when I said that now people are notorious religious. And by notorious religious, I was saying, I can even share a story that happened to me. You remember, I mean, that, that happened to my family. I think I uh, have a, I personally relate to that. Um, um, my, my family, my grandmother, um, she was a, a Christian until 1972. And the reason she was, she had, she had, she had, she had gone in this religion, in, in, in Christianity. And she was, she had this powerful post. But uh, when, in 1972, she says her daughter, who is my auntie, she fell sick, and they tried everything that they could. They went to doctors, they went to prophets, they went to, but they were told that, ah, ah this one is beyond help, until she went to a traditional Esangoma or a traditional healer, who told her that this child is possessed by the spirit of her grandfather. And then the spirit of her, of her grandfather, it wants you as a family to go back to Mozambique, because my grandfather was from Mozambique, and my grandmother was from Zimbabwe. And then they had, they, they had to go to Mozambique. And when they, she, they were in Mozambique, she was miraculously healed, right? So that's how my grandfather said, ah, no, 
if uh, these forces, if these powers can't really heal, let me just leave Christianity. And then she left. Yeah, just like that. So there is, there is uh, now people, they believe in Christianity. But when the going gets tough, they go back to the spirits. So they can even they can even pretend to say, ah, oh, we are Christians, we don't this, do these things. They are linked to paganism, they are linked to heathenism, they are linked to satanism, right. But when the going gets really tough, they go back to the spirits. And they bow to say, spirits, can you please help us and stuff. So there's this syncretism that you do this. I think I can, I can even say there's an element of religious syncretism amongst the now people. Because even if they, I think even, even at national level, as you said, Zimbabwe has, I think, around 80% uh, of Christians, right? But you still, you still see what the leaders do. They, from time to time, uh, ask these uh, traditional groups and women, you have much more Wimbo, you have, uh, yeah, you see. Okay. All right. Yes, Mr. Kuhn. I guess I had a question about uh, how you understand this various, you know, iterations of spirit possession. I had a question about context, I suppose, and, and kind of what is the catalyst for possession? You know what I'm saying? Is there like a dance presentation? Is there a musical ceremony that's associated with this that then invokes possession in a certain kind of way? Yes, thank you very much, thank you very much. Uh, I said I was not going to look at that, but uh, I know the answers that you are looking for. <laughs> yes, uh, so, so, like, so, uh, you know, when you want to interact and engage with these spirits, so, sometimes they come on their own, all right? For example, it sees that there's a danger, my daughter is going to be struck by a snake, or she's going to be, be, to be beaten by a dog, and then this spirit, if it wants, it can come, and then it can fight the, uh, the it can fight against the snake or stuff. But uh, in situations where I was going to, uh, to 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 interview the spirit, where I requested to talk to them, we had to use music. So people will do, uh, so we would have uh, a people uh, a group of people who would sing, and in some cases they would play drums. So that we are asking, we are begging the spirit to come, we are cajoling it to come and then it comes, so that's the catalyst. So you have to sing, and you don't know how many songs until the spirit comes. And then sometimes you can say, sing harder, and then you have to sing, 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 until the, spirits come, the spirit comes. And so yes. then these songs as well are in doubt. Yeah, yes, yes, so, 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 so what happens is that um, uh, for Majiti spirit, they speak, uh, they, 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 they sing uh, Nguni songs, and these mediums, because when they, in ever the, 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 the spirits are with us, they are here, they speak, they, they, they sing these songs. So these people, they know these songs. So they speak these songs. Like for instance, I have lots and lots of songs that I, 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 I got that, and maybe I can play them for you. So they, yeah, so they, 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 they sing these songs. They sing these Nguni songs, and then some of people, some of the people, they bring drums and they play. But one thing that I found interesting was also that uh, I think I was discussing that with the Prophet at one point, to say, now I saw that they now are resort to Christian songs, or songs that look like they are Christian in nature, like songs like, Hallelujah. and you say, why, these are traditional spirits, why are they now uh, uh, going to the extent of singing Christian songs, you know? But then you also get to know that these spirits, as I said, they also get to learn. So they learn so that be, so they, they learn because they want to they would want to relate well and better with uh, the people that are around. Yeah. Ariana, yeah, thank you very much for presenting that. I'm really interested in your idea of interdependency of spirit and body and how this connects to languages and practices amongst those people that you discuss. So um, at some point you talk about the morphology of those languages that most of the words are animals of the same morphemes, um, even though they are spirit language and um, the other language, I mean, the real languages around the same region or the geographical territory that you're researching also have um, you know, similar words like that. So I'm really curious about how there is any, con if there is any connection between um, the linguistic forms of these 
spirit bodies or I mean the spirits. So because it seems like the way you're describing it that uh, the people interact with the spirit. And you said at some point that you cannot even like get closer to the spirit, the there's a way they use the language and all of that. So are this language totally separated? Or at some point, there is an influx of that into the real language use of the people. So, is it like? Okay. Yeah. Okay. Uh, okay. Uh, I'm not sure I get that uh, uh, correctly, but uh, let me say. Um, so, there are situations where we have a uh, clear cut distinction between the language that is spoken by, that is uh, spoken by a spirit and the language that is used in the, in the community. For example, the issue of Majiti spirits. They speak Goni languages, and Goni is not in any way connected to Dao, right? Mm -hmm. So in those situations, you find that uh, uh, these two languages, they are completely different. They are in different language zones, right? For example, I think for those that did historical, that, uh, that uh, studied the historical linguistics, they would know that Goni is S10, and then Shona is S16 and stuff, right? So, so, so what happens is that uh, uh, you find that uh, these languages they speak, so that's one thing that we use actually to, to, to distinguish and discern whether this is a true spirit and a fake spirit. So if somebody who has never been to South Africa, somebody who has never, oh, like for example, if somebody who is here, maybe uh, Alia, and then she's possessed by a good spirit, and then she starts speaking Goni, and then we can say, ah, this is a good, this is a true spirit, it's a genuine spirit, you know, because it is speaking a language that it has no history with. That does not connect with in any way, right? So it, 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 at some point we use that. But now, uh, what we got to, to, to what, when I was analyzing this, I realized that the longer the spirit takes when uh, it has possessed somebody, for example, somebody has been possessed by this spirit for 50 years, right? Like the cases that I was talking about. You find that this was an elderly, an, an, an elderly um, medium. She had been possessed by that spirit when she was a girl, but she was very old now. So you'd find that uh, maybe you can understand that this is why uh, this spirit now is now incorporating certain elements from Tao. And uh, you would find that this spirit is now, and in, in some cases, uh, uh, those spirits, they no longer need mediums because they've been there in the environment for quite a long time. So they don't need any, 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 any attendant who translates. Because when I was talking to them, because I, there are certain languages that I don't understand. There's the spirit medium here, there's an attendant here who would say, I would speak in, in my language, or whether English or Shona, and then on now, and then this one converts into the language that is understood by the spirit. So in some cases, when you are dealing with spirits that have been there for a long time, there's no need for a medium, because it can understand you, and then it speaks back to you in its own language or in its broken Shintao uh, variety. So are there points where um, regular people who are not participants in that spirit world, maybe after some time, begin to use the spirit language in other contexts outside of the religious? Mm, okay. Yes, yes, yes. Uh, but I don't think there are such contexts because the spirits are not always there, you know. Okay. So for you to be able to speak a language, then you need to, to be accustomed to it. You need to be, I mean, you need to learn it, you know. So the spirits, they come once in a while. They are not like spirits are there every day. But as children, you might find children imitating some way to say, oh, I'm a spirit, what, what, what? But it's not a language that uh, anybody in the community can really use because, okay, yes. Okay. I'm a worker from my wife. My question is um, about the dominance, power, knowledge, and control between the spirit and the human world. And in Hansa culture, we have um, like um, the spirits are always some steps ahead of the human beings in the sense that they grow their knowledge, their ingredients from the, um, like from the God. But I don't know if uh, in my presentation if there is um, somewhere because you said the spirits also learn from the human beings. So I don't know where they get their knowledge, their strength to be able to have influence in the human beings. Mm, okay, can, can, you, can you say that again? Yeah, in House of Culture, for instance, yes, yes, yes. get their knowledge from the, from the gods, yeah. the celestial being. Okay. And 
and their religion is used as an antidote against their influence of the human beings who want to possess somebody. But I don't know. Okay. Yeah, okay. in your presentation, if they have the same source of knowledge or. Um, I, 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 uh, I'm not sure, but what I know is that these spirits, because they are spirits now, uh, they are powerful. So they have their own power. So whether they derived it from another god, uh, maybe, but I don't know. But they have their own power, so they can actually heal, they can even foretell future events, they can even uh, prophesy, they can even tell you all sorts of other things. So we believe that uh, I'm useless as I'm here, but when I die, I become uh, powerful, I become more knowledgeable. There are lots and lots of other things that I may not know as a human being, but I will know everything because I'm a spirit now. So I don't know whether my, I will derive my power from, from a higher God, or maybe I just have it because I died. I don't know. Yeah. Yes, ma'am. I'm curious as to whether um, spirits become too dangerous to the community. Mm -hmm. And if that happens, I mean, if that becomes the case, what, what then happens? What do you think to do about that? And then my second question is about um, you talked about the fact that sometimes, um, you know, when the spirit possesses someone and they eat those, you know, the spirits and they're done. And the person comes around to themselves and they're like, oh, I'm hungry. So I'm wondering, there's kind of like a fluidity in, in that regard. So I'm wondering, has there ever been a case where people, um, you know, where people kind of like pretend that they're possessed just to you know, eat good food? Yes, 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 yes. <laughs> okay. Uh, yes. Thank you very much for thank you very much for those questions. Uh, so the first one is that uh, my my response to the first one is that uh, these spirits they don't get dangerous just on papers because they feel like getting dangerous, right? They don't. Get, they don't easily get angry. So you have to do something to offend the spirit. And then maybe I'm a host and then I'm becoming promiscuous, I'm becoming a thief, I'm becoming a murderer. Then that's, uh, that, that's, those are the things that trigger the anger of the spirit. And when it does that, when, when, it, in, in, when it gets to that point, it gets angry. Right? And then when it is angry, there are certain ways of trying to appease it. You can go and beg for forgiveness, think for forgiveness, you can even find other spirits to come and intercede and intervene and, and, and then the spirit can even uh, punish you. It can say, okay, because you did A, B, C, and D, I want you to uh, prepare maybe 15, 15 bowels of beer and then I don't know how many drums of, of, uh, of, 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 of sadza, sadza is thick porridge, and uh, you can even kill a beast to, appear, to try and say, I'm sorry, to try and appease the spirit so that it doesn't get dangerous. Because really, if it gets dangerous, you won't like it. It can cause sickness to you as an individual or to your children, you know. It can even kill your children because you made it, you annoyed it, you know. So when it gets angry, it can get angry, but simply because you have done something to offend it. And then when it gets that point to that point, then some people, they do certain ways of trying to resolve the disputes. And then the second one, yes, we have many cases like that, really. We really have many cases where some people pretend that they are possessed because they want to eat food. But now, uh, in situations like that, uh, those that are genuinely possessed, they can pick out to say, this one is not true possession. Because they are spirits, they know. So they can tell you that this one is, uh, is, is, is actually a fake spirit. And they have ways of, uh, of, of finding uh, that out. They can even ask you where you are coming from. They can even do certain things, uh, like for instance, because they are spirits, you know. So they can they can easily pick that up without any problems, and then they can even expose you for what you are. Thank you. We're out of time. Thank you, everyone, for coming. Let's get that.